So basically, let's start off with a, a little bit of me, so you kind of know where I'm coming from and where I've been and what I've done. And, and uh, even though I'm very new to alfalfa, uh, just uh, you can understand the weeds I've worked on uh, and the crops I've worked on and what I'm hoping to do in the future. I grew up in Pennsylvania in a coal mining town, so I didn't actually come from an ag background. Uh, I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, literally coal mining town, deep vein mining, not the strip mining on the western part. This is the anthracite on the eastern side. I grew up in Pennsylvania, got a degree in biology, worked in the horticulture industry in southeastern Pennsylvania for about three to four years, worked in different botanic gardens, worked in different nurseries, Went back to the University of Delaware, got my master's degree in plant pathology, went to Ohio State and got a PhD in weed science, did a year at Wisconsin as a postdoc, went down to Georgia where I was five years working at the Tifton Research Station, went to the University of California Davis for five years as a research scientist, up to Washington State for a year and now back down. Now the reason I can't hold a job has nothing to do with me, it has to do with my husband who keeps getting transferred around the country, but I've told him we are done moving because we have moved five times in eight years and, and I'm, I'm done. This is, this is a little too much. So that's where I've been with respect to, to the research I've done, just a little bit of information. Uh, we've been talking about cotton, we've been talking about Palmer amaranth. Uh, I've done a lot of work. That was my work pretty much in Georgia. And so I spent five years in Georgia working with Palmer amaranth and cotton. Um, looked at pollen movement and the spread of glyphosate resistance in Palmer amaranth across the landscape. I looked at incomplete weed control effects on weed seed production. This was a study that I was talking about where we went in and simulated failed hand weeding attempts. I looked at how long and how deep we could bury the seed and how that affected seed longevity for Palmer amaranth. Uh, here in California, I've done work on hairy fleabane and horseweed, looking at the size and weed control and seed production uh, in tree and vine systems. I've looked at how temperature and shade affects jungle rice growth and development here in the, uh, the valley. And I've done a lot of work looking at the biology, the ecology, and the management of field bindweed. So with respect to those are the weeds I've worked with, and I've, I've done more than that, done methyl bromide alternatives and, and uh, fallow, uh, you know, green seeker technology up in, in, in wheat. Uh, with respect to the crops I've worked on, I've, I've done almost every crop pretty much. I feel cotton, cantaloupes, honeydew, watermelon, processing tomatoes, fresh market tomatoes and peppers. I've done the tree and vine crops, apples up in Washington, blueberries in Washington. I've done dry land wheat, and now I'm starting to learn alfalfa. So what I am looking for uh, since I've, I've started and I'm joining is, is I'm also looking to learn about the crops and the systems here in California learn about your needs for alfalfa, your weed management concerns, etc. And I'm also looking for collaborators uh, for the coming year. We've got a couple grants to do some work looking at weed control in both seedling and established alfalfa. And so I'm looking for field sites to put trials in uh, for the 2018-2019 season. So we can skip this section on why weed control. Obviously, we're talking about yield loss, um, stand loss, stunting, anything that affects you know, total biomass production. But there's also effects on palatability uh, and uh, toxicity issues related to, to different weeds uh, within the system. Just as an example, fiddle neck, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, also sometimes called fireweed or tarweed. Uh, poisoning by alkaloids, actually the exact same alkaloids that allow for uh, the poisoning from common groundsel, and why it's so problematic, mostly affecting horses and cattle, less or so pigs, and then sheep and goats, less than that. Chronic symptoms uh, in livestock, usually irreversible liver damage that occurs after two to eight months, loss of appetite, weight loss, diarrhea, jaundice, and also in horses, these alkaloids cause a, very, uh, a variety of neurological disorders such as head pressing, awkward gait, uh, confusion, uh, and some other issues. Hey, Lynn? Yes. Um, 
on the fiddle neck, because I'm a horse person, uh, after that fiddle neck has been baled and dried, is it still as toxic? You know what? I do not necessarily have an answer for that. However, I was going to point out okay. where the answer is. Okay. Um, because, you know, I sometimes don't focus on, 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 on that aspect. Yeah. But the University of California, and this is where I'm going to plug UCANR system, has a variety of manuals that you can get. And I actually just discovered this one the other day. It's online as a PDF, Livestock Poisoning. Uh, Plants of California. It is a massive PDF. It has all the species. It's extremely well done. And basically, if you go into the UA, UC ANR catalog and put in livestock poisoning plants California, you're going to get it. And it's it's actually pretty fantastic. I only just made these slides the other day, but I, I'm going to sit down and read this because I find it interesting. So we obviously know the reasons for weed control. And, you know, I'm not Mick Canaveri, I'm not Ron Vargas, I'm not those guys who could come here and tell you, yo, you should be putting Chateau down with this and this at this time to take care of this weed. I can't do that yet because I'm just getting started in these systems. What I can tell you, though, is I can tell you the different factors that are really kind of consistent across all systems of why you might have poor weed control. And I'm just going to talk about that and hit some highlights about you know, those issues that are causing, you know, um, escapes in our systems and are affecting uh, the efficacy of the different strategies that we're employing. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is paying attention to the weed species and the weed spectrum uh, that's in a system because even closely related products are not going to control the exact same weeds. And weeds are not going to be sensitive or susceptible to the same control strategies. So one thing about weed control and, and why it's so important, I'm going to apologize with the light here. These pictures are going to appear blown out. But weed ID is important, and this is something I'm really interested in. And if you've got questions about weeds and you don't know something, call me, email me, text me, tweet me, and, and we'll get you an ID. Weeds are important because weed management strategies aren't effective equally against all weed species. And that comes down to this, this, this concept of selectivity. All of the practices that we use for weed management select for different weeds uh, as opposed to others. They might control something better than another. And that's sometimes why we have weed shifts and weed escapes is because we use the same practice over and over again, we select to get rid of certain species but keep others. And selectivity can come down to herbicide selectivity, whether we're using something that's targeting grasses versus broadleaves, but it can be mowing that can differentially affect erect versus perennial species, uh, cultivation that can control annuals but allow perennials to persist, you know, and the timing of operations, maybe something that, that's targeting <coughs> winter weeds versus summer weeds or vice versa. One of the best examples that I like to use for understanding who you've got are the nut sedges. Purple and yellow nut sedge. And I know we have a north to south gradient uh, where we have more yellow in the north and purple in the south, but we do have an area where they mix. These species are really closely related. They're both in the Cyperus genus. They look like little bits of differences in how their tubers are born, whether they're chains or singly. But I'll tell you what. These two species, despite being closely related, respond differently to herbicides. They respond differently to glyphosate. They respond differently to dual magnum. They respond differently to metribuzin. So this is why it's really important to understand what species you're working with, because you can have this differential activity on, of products on species. In fact, we did a study in Georgia looking at purple and yellow nut sedge where we wanted to look at how well they did under black plastic in our vegetable production systems. Black plastic by itself was effective at suppressing yellow nut sedge. Purple nut sedge exploded under the black plastic. It did better under the black plastic than it did in bare ground systems. So that's why it's important to understand weed identification because successful identification is basically the basis for your management strategy. Knowing what you have, 
means that you can adopt strategies that are really going to target the species with respect to their sensitivity to control measures. If you're interested in weed identification tools, there's some books out there, Weeds of the West. It's no longer in print, but it is a great book. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it on eBay. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna get updated from here on out. So what's there, what's there, is what's there. If a new species comes into the area, it's not gonna get included in there. It's not gonna get updated with respect to um, nomenclature, to the names and taxonomy changes, but it's a great book. I use it as my truck book. That's what I carry around if I need a book for identifying weeds. There's Weeds in California and other western states that's put out by the UC a &R system. It's a two volume set. It's a little bit pricier. It's, it's more something to sit on a shelf, but it's probably hands <coughs> down the best book for weed ID in the western US. There's also smartphone apps. So if you're using a smartphone, everyone asks me, is there an app out there where I can just take a picture of a weed and I can upload this picture and it will tell me what this weed is? And there actually is. It's called PlantNet. And you can find it in your app store if you've got an Android phone or you've got an Apple, uh, an iPhone. And what you do is you download the PlantNet. You can take a picture. You can upload a picture that you've already got in your, in your files. And you can say, hit the little like submit button, and, and it will scan your weed against its database of images. And it will tell you what your weed is. Now, this is the thing. It's going to return a result. It might not always be the right result. Just because you get a, pick, a, a result back doesn't mean it's accurate. I mean, you can take a picture of a plastic flower. It's going to try and tell you what that plastic flower is. But it is actually, I think, a, a, a good strategy for getting started. You know, you could say, oh yeah, that's it, or oh gosh, no. Just be mindful if you're gonna use it. You know, it's, 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 uh, its efficacy can vary with the user. I can get about a 70% uh, positive result, you know, first time when I use it, but I'm a weed scientist and I know what structures to take a picture of, you know, that would identify a weed versus uh, a, a, another one. So I think my use of it is probably a bit biased by my knowledge and my background. Um, if you're going to do it, make sure you get a clear picture, make sure you minimize the background. You cannot stand back 50 feet from something, take a picture and think it's going to get it. You're going to have to get close. Take pictures of really <coughs> defining characteristics or structures. Uh, to you know about the, the use of IPM weed identification? Well, you, you know what? I actually don't use it. Okay. Just because, I mean, it's it's good, but it's not developed for a smartphone. Yeah, no, it's totally better on a desktop computer. That's just like when we did our PCA classes, they like, it's a, use that, use that, use that. It's going to give you the best results. You know, that's what they like always to use, so that's I mean, I there, there's nothing wrong with it. It is a desktop thing. It is too hard to use if you're out in the field with when you're doing this. Yeah. It, it, it's not designed for that. I personally think that the uh, the database is a little bit limited uh, okay. with with the UC IPM. Um, I think Weeds California. But when it's like crop specific. Do you think that that helps narrow it down because you're able to? Because you're able to drop down and pick like from like seven or ten of like the main target crops that they've like identified as it being like a main. I think crop. it can help with main weeds, but you know what? When people call me for weed ID, yeah, they're they're like, it's, it's, like it's, it's, it's the bizarre one that they've never seen before. Yeah, that's true. So I mean, it's got its utility. Uh -huh. But you think this one is a little better to use on your smartphone? I think if you're gonna, I, I, I. I say try using PlantNet on the smartphone. Just understand it. A result yeah. does not mean accuracy. Oh yeah, it, it means it's the same with that. It's going to give you results based on what you put in. So and, and that's another thing that I've talked about with some of there are because there are other there are apps out there that act as like kind of a drop down dichotomous key. You, uh -huh. you know, you don't put a picture in. You say, okay, it's a broadleaf. It has wavy edges. Yeah. It's got this or this or this. You know what? And it's all a function on what you put in and yeah. how well you put information in. Because if you put in the wrong thing, then it's going to completely dismiss all of these options that it could be. Exactly. Yeah. 
So I, I like the IPM tool. I don't use it, but I think we're, I'm at a different stage or a different yeah. level. Um, I use PlantNet on my phone. Mm -hmm. like if, you know, I get out there and I've got, you know, particularly with, like, there are native species out there that are maybe on field margins, you know, like uh, Mexican milkweed or uh, Centromedia, which is a tar weed. You know, these, these, these ones, the UCI PM isn't going to get. I use I use PlantNet, yeah, and, and that's where I capture things. But I think the thing is, is always double check. What, regardless of what you're using, double double check your double check your work. Mm -hmm. So we talked about how how weeds can be differentially susceptible to herbicides. The herbicides themselves, even though they might be used for basically the same function in, in, in a system, uh, they can have a different selectivity uh, against weed species. For instance, uh, Benefin versus EPTC. You know, they're, they're not in the same herbicide classes, but they're both inhibit cell division. They're both used for pre-plant, pre-emergence weed control. Very different products, very different performance. Benefin getting small seed of broadleaves, but mostly the summer species and really better suited for spring plantings. Whereas EPTC gets the small seed of broadleaves, gets the grasses to a much greater range than Benefin does, gets volunteer cereals, gets yellow, purple, and nut sedge, uh, as long as it's applied before tuber sprouting. So this is kind of a, a, a reason for understanding the weeds that you're there for choosing the best herbicide products in the system. Another example of uh, differential performance of products based on, on weeds, Amazomox and Imazethapir. Both WSSA ALS inhibitors uh, both have pre-emergence and uh, post-emergence of, uh, of efficacy against weeds. Both are actually, not only just ALS inhibitors, are in the same class of herbicides within the ALS category, but very different weed spectrums. Amazomox having much better grass control to imazepapir. For instance, getting hair barley, rip butt brome, rat tail fescue, Italian ryegrass, etc. If you're interested in the performance of these herbicides and the susceptibility of uh, different weed species found in alfalfa or any other production system to the herbicides that are listed, at the UC ANR IPM website, they actually have susceptibility charts. You can go there, you can pull it up for that crop, and it will list the major weed species along uh, the y-axis down the column, and then across the top, it'll have the herbicides, and it'll have green, yellow, or gray, whether it controls a species or not. So you can actually make comparisons of the different products uh, and their performance on the species in your system. Weed size is, is super important for managing uh, weed control. We were talking about Palmer amaranth, we were talking about Liberty. As soon as Palmer amaranth gets over three inches, forget it, Liberty is not gonna get it. Uh, it's just gonna burn it back and it's gonna regrow. And herbicide label guidelines are, are researched really to ensure that they can maximize control. This is some work that we did with Harry Fleabane, and it's the influence of plant size at the time of application, and I know it's hard to see, but basically uh, we took glyphosate-resistant Fleabane and we wanted to see how well um, Rely 280, Gramoxo, Nintion, and Trevix, which is safufenicil, which is sharpened in alfalfa systems, uh, performed against hairy flea bane and for managing it. When we were tiny, four to five leaf stage, 100% control with these contact herbicides. 15 to 20 leaf, 100% control with our Rely and our Gramoxone started to drop off with the tree bits. As soon as that plant started to bolt, as soon as we started getting our flower stalk shooting up, we dropped to 60% or below. Timing matters, plant size matters when it comes to control, and that includes with Roundup. There's a lot of people out there who are like, ah, oh, Roundup will get it, I can spray a 12 inch weed, I can go out there, I'm, Roundup will take care of it. This was work that was done at the Kearney Ag Center by Tim Prather and Anil Shrestha, and basically 
What it shows is that as our plants get bigger, hairy flea bane and horseweed, as they get bigger, the amount of glyphosate you need to affect good control also increases. So we often think about size being important for our contact herbicides, but it's important with our systemic products as well. These are the weed size recommendations for various her post-emergence herbicides registered for use in alfalfa. Most of them below three inches. A lot of them below two inches. There's a few that allow for the six inch, uh, the, the herbicides like sethoxidim and clethidim and glyphosate that have that systemic activity, but we don't really want these plants getting larger. The larger they get, the harder to control they are. The more chance we have for escapes, the greater chance we have for seed production and returning seed to the seed bank and for selecting for herbicide resistance. But one thing about weed control is that sometimes it's more than just size. And this is going to be incredibly hard to see, but I want to bring this concept up. Because people ask me with hairy flea bane, Sometimes, you know, you go in in the spring and you spray hairy flea bane and you're not getting as good control as you think you should be. And things that Kurt Hambry and I have talked about, Brad Hansen and I have talked about, I know Mick Canterbury has talked about, is that emergence time with some of these winter species could really be affecting their performance uh, with different herbicide products. The ones that are emerging in the fall, sorry, you know, they're emerging, they're growing to a size, they're reached kind of an above ground size, but we're wondering if their root system isn't still growing over the winter and these plants are getting bigger underground and they're hardening off. And so even though in the spring they might be the same size as a spring emerged hairy flea bane plant, they are not the same plant. They're not the same plant physiologically, they're not the same plant based on the root system. And we think that there is really something going on here with our, our winter annual species that we definitely want to test. We think that, you know, even though the above ground size might not appear to differ between those fall and those spring emerging plants at a certain time, they're different beasts and they're not responding to herbicides the same way. So herbicide formulation, the herbicide formulation can affect the concentration of the active ingredient and then the use rates. This really comes down, I think, one of the best examples of herbicide formulation and use rate and really understanding what product you're dealing with is got to be Roundup. Um, so the, uh, WSSA9 EPFPS inhibitor, there is a ton of Roundup out there. There's across all uh, all, all, all commodities, we're, we're talking hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of Roundup products out there, and they are not the same. They are formulated in, in different ways, and they're formulated to have different concentrations of active ingredients, and this is hard to see, but basically we have glyphosate at 4, 5, 5.45, 5.5, 6, of pounds of active ingredient per gallon. And then what would be the standard uh, 1x dose? And the standard 1x dose rate for a formulation that is six pounds of active ingredient per gallon is not the same as one that's four pounds of active ingredient per gallon. And I hear a lot of guys out there, oh, I put down 22 ounces of glyphosate. Well, 22 ounces of glyphosate, if you're 5.5 pounds, is, is one thing and gives you one level of performance, but if you're talking uh, four pounds of AI per gallon, your standard 1x dose rate is no longer 22 ounces uh, per acre, it's now 32 ounces per acre. So I sometimes, this was particularly up in Washington State in the apples, I'd say, ah, oh, 22 ounces, 22 ounces, 22 ounces. 22 ounces of what? That changes things a lot. And you can't assume that you know for one product what the, you, you can't translate that necessarily to the next product. And then some of these products are formulated with different adjuvants, and that's a whole other bugaboo altogether that affects performance. Spray solution. 
I'm really amazed that sometimes people who don't realize that the quality of their spray solution affects the performance of the herbicide. Sometimes I see this a lot actually in horticultural systems. Uh, guys who are maybe doing roadsides, who are working in, in urban areas. Your water, your, your spray tank, that, that product that you're putting out is predominantly water. It's probably greater than 95, 90% water. So what goes in comes affects what comes out and water quality has a huge impact on herbicide performance and again glyphosate is one of those products that's the best example. Mm -hmm. You have a high pH, high pH causes glyphosate to dissociate. It, it breaks apart in the solution and it's not as effective. Cations in the water, magnesium, calcium, sodium, bind to glyphosate and reduce its absorptive ability. If you have any kind of organic matter or soil in your water, if you don't have clean water, it binds to the glyphosate and it reduces the performance of the glyphosate. That's why ammonium sulfate is so important. Glyphosate is antagonized by salts in hard water, like calcium, like sodium, magnesium. Those ions are going to bind to glyphosate and it's going to reduce its performance. The ammonium and the sulfate in the ammonium sulfate are both active to improve glyphosate performance. Sulfate binds to those ions, so they can't bind to the glyphosate. The ammonium binds to the glyphosate, and it helps it to become more readily absorbed into the foliage uh, when it's combined with ammonium than with those other ions. Put the ammonium sulfate in first. There's a lot of guys who put the glyphosate in the tank and then put the ammonium sulfate in ammonium sulfate goes in first. I am not a herbicide chemist, but these guys are. So if you're interested in spray water quality and glyphosate performance, Purdue University has got the best handout ever on glyphosate efficacy. You just Google glyphosate spray water quality and Purdue, and you've got it. And it is the best three to four page document on glyphosate that you'll get out there. So this is the one thing I'm interested in, is herbicide resistance. And this is a, a big topic that I like to, to bring up because I think uh, we need to be much more aware of it sometimes than we are. Right now in the world, there's 495 unique cases of herbicide resistance worldwide. That's species by herbicide site of action combination. There's 255 different species with resistance. So even though we have 495 unique cases, half of those are, are the same species multiple times with different herbicide groups. There's 148 dicots, 107 grasses. We have 26 known herbicide sites of action. We have documented resistance somewhere in the world to 23 of them. So that's really problematic, and 163 different herbicides. So we've got problems. And if you're wondering what country leads the way with herbicide resistance, it's the United States with 160. So why pay attention to herbicide resistance? And I'm going backwards. This shows you the number of herbicide resistant species uh, relative to individual active herbicides. Number one is atrazine, next is imazepapir, then tribenuron, methyl, glyphosate, and mazamox. Uh, a couple more ALS inhibitors, and there's a grass herbicide, then there's paraquat, simazine. The reason I wanted to bring this up, since we were talking about alfalfa, is that four of the major products that we use, and this is actually from the CDPR database looking at the the, the top products of herbicide used in California for 2016. In the top 10, glyphosate, paraquat, and mazamox, and amazathapir. And these are some of the top herbicides that have had resistance developed to them worldwide. So, in California, we have 30 herbicide resistance cases. Now, that means 30 cases. That doesn't necessarily mean you know, it uh, doesn't describe how widespread they are. Some are very narrow, some are very widespread across the state, like with our hairy flea bane. We break it up into two major groups. The first major category 
for herbicide resistance is in our rice systems where we have selected weeds that are resistant to ALS and ACCase inhibitors. The second category is all the systems where we're using a lot of glyphosate. Our trees and vines, non-crop areas, canal banks, Roundup ready crops. Glyphosate resistance has developed in here. These are the species that we know that we have glyphosate resistant populations around the state. Bridge and ryegrass, horse wheat, hairy flea bait, jungle rice, Italian ryegrass, annual bluegrass, and now Palmer amaranth most recently. These are the species that we suspect we have glyphosate resistance to and that we are testing right now. Three spike goosegrass, feather finger grass, windmill grass, frangle top, and witchgrass, all summer grasses. So for a while there, we were really concerned about our winter annuals, like our hairy flea bane, our horse weed. Now it's our summer grasses that we're really paying attention to. And like I said, Brad Hansen's lab, I know that they're involved in either screening these or getting ready or wanting to screen these for herbicide resistance. We also have populations of weeds in California that are resistant to more than one herbicide. Barnyard glass and, and late water grass in our rice systems, we found populations that have resistance to ACCase inhibitors, as well as lipid biosynthesis inhibitors. In our orchard systems, we have hairy flea bane and horse wheat that are both resistant to glyphosate and paraquat. And we've also just recently documented Italian ryegrass in orchards and alfalfa systems that have resistance to grass herbicides, glyphosate, paraquat, and ALS inhibitors. So you're talking uh, products like clethodim, cethoxidim, glyphosate, gramoxone, and mazamox, and mazethapir. They might not be incredibly widespread, but they exist in California. And alfalfa systems are unique. They both can deter the development of resistance, and at the same time, they have characteristics about them that facilitate the development of resistance. They're perennial crops and they're vigorous once they're established. Cutting can definitely interfere with weed growth and seed production, and limited soil disturbance really creates a poor environment for seed germination for a lot of species. So alfalfa has it going for it. Those are some traits that prevent the development of resistance. At the same time, the absence of soil disturbance uh, reduces the opportunity for uh, different control strategies, we are using repeated applications sometimes, some people, such as glyphosate or ALS inhibitors, and those drive selection pressure. Alfalfa in California isn't grown in a vacuum, and we can't not pay attention to adjacent systems. And the resistant weeds in those adjacent systems, especially if there's a lot of flea bane, if there's a lot of horse weed, uh, because those seeds can move into uh, alfalfa production areas. Uh, this is actually a picture from not too far from here in Fireball, uh, weeds on the field margin. This is all horseweed and hairy flea bane uh, that's under this land planter. It is just a source of seed to move into that cotton field, to the alfalfa field, to the orchard right next to it. So managing these other environments is also kind of crucial. Perennial weeds, uh, are, are problematic field bindweed, convolvulus arvensis, and Johnson grass. Both have a lot of traits that make them super difficult to control. Spreading by rhizome and seeds. Majority of the rhizomes for field bindweed are found in the top two feet of soil, but roots can go down 20, 10 to 30 feet deep. Barnyard grass, most of the rhizomes are in that top foot of soil, but they have found them down five feet Actually, infrequent and shallow cultivation makes these guys tougher and stronger and just moves them around. If you're not in there, they, there were studies that was done out of Kansas in the 1940s, 1950s. You had to cultivate every two weeks for three years to get rid of field bindweed. If you go in into a fallow area once or twice, cultivate, basically all you've done is you move those rhizomes around and spread it further. Both of these plants within three weeks of seedling emergence are already taking character on characteristics of perennial plants. They're already forming rhizomes. They're already forming new crowns, new roots. They're already starting to perennialize within a month 
of getting out of the ground. That's how quickly these plants develop. The seeds can remain dormant for up to 10 years in Johnson grass, and there's reports of bindweed seeds remaining dormant for 30 to 50 years. So even if you think that you've been able to manage a rhizome population, there's the potential that the seeds uh, in the seed bank can uh, reestablish. So perennial weeds, difficult to manage uh, because a lot of the herbicides that we use, they don't attack those <coughs> rhizomes. They don't attack the reservoirs of buds you know, that support uh, the next year's growth. These are the top herbicides used in alfalfa, pendimethylin, glyphosate, clethodim, paraquat, trifluralin, amazimox, and hexazinone. We get some partial control of these different species. With glyphosate, we need repeat applications. Clethodim is good against uh, Johnson grass. The rest of these, no control uh, or very limited control from these other products. So weeds, perennial weeds, light field vine weed, need to be managed in those seasons, preferentially two to three years in advance of an alfalfa crop going in. With crops that are more competitive to perennials, such as small grains or corn, have more in-crop herbicide options, or come off earlier due to their harvest timing that gives you a fallow period where you can have this intensive management. Uh, this is just some perennial weed management efforts. We won't go through it. Basically, glyphosate in Roundup Ready systems, 2,4-DB for field fine weed for suppression, again, multiple applications, clethodim, glyphosate uh, for Johnson grass, again, multiple applications. There's no one shot uh, that's going to manage these species particularly well. The last thing I want to talk about is bring up climate change and variability. Temperatures are projected to rise. Our precipitation patterns are projected to be more erratic, more variable. So how are these, uh, these forces going to affect the potential weeds that we're going to deal with and our potential for controlling them? One, we're probably going to see rain shifts. We are going to see migration of weed species because they're going to be able to move with, with temperature patterns and be established in more northern locations. So expect more tropical species to start moving more northward. We're already seeing that. Palmer amaranth is native to the southwestern desert. We've got it up in North Dakota. We think we have it in Oregon. We think we have it in Washington. Also expect trade shifts and adaptation. We might see extended germination windows where weeds we thought only germinated in a short period in the spring might now be able to germinate over a longer period of the summer requiring control at times that we weren't controlling them in the past. We also might see changes in perennial plant dormancy. Maybe vine weed isn't going dormant in the fall. Maybe it's staying active longer. Maybe it's competing longer uh, with various crops. We have to think about how temperature rainfall patterns and how water availability in response to temperature and rainfall patterns could impact herbicide use and efficacy. There's some work that's being done out of Colorado State University where they've looked at different soil moisture potentials and they've actually found weeds can germinate in drier soils and the herbicides that control them get activated. So there's a lot of potential here for factors that are beyond our control to impact weed management in the future. And I'm going to argue we should be looking at Imperial County, we should be looking at Riverside County, and paying attention to problems that they're having as an indicator of potential future concerns to deal with here in the valley, in the Intermountain region, uh, in the Sacramento Valley, etc. UC resources, there's IPM guidelines for both weeds, for weed control and both seedling and established alfalfa. These were all updated in March of 2017. Uh, so they're there uh, for the information. There's information about special weed problems such as daughter, nut sedge, Johnson grass, field vine weed. There's herbicide treatment tables uh, located at the IPM website. There's also the susceptibility charts, again, if you're curious about how to compare all of these herbicides together at one time, 
instead of looking at this label, then this label, then this label, then this label. These are put together by the weed scientists at the University of California, and they basically have all the herbicides that are registered, color-coded right there with their, the susceptibility that's listed on the label and also some of their own uh, personal information thrown in there uh, demonstrating that. So, summary, proper species identification, proper product selection for the spectrum, formulation, selection, and rate use, optimize your spray water quality and quantity. We didn't touch on GPA, but understanding what GPAs work best, higher GPAs for contact herbicides, lower GPA for glyphosate, pay attention to resistance and resistance development, manage perennials in advance, and understanding that there's a lot of forces out there that aren't under our control. These top ones we can think about. We can pay attention to the weeds. We can choose the products. We can make sure that the water is, is, is properly conditioned. We can put it out at the right volume. But there's other factors out there that are going to drive changes in weeds and weed communities. And we have to be aware of it. And we have to be looking for these shifts that might be beyond our, our management control. Uh, again, paying attention to up and coming problems. If you need me. You can get me through UCANR. I am at the Merced County office. That's the county phone number. And uh, thank you, all three of you, <laughs> all three, for your time. <laughs>